If you like steam power, consider making a tax-deductible donation at lptv.org. Steam Power in Dalton and Blackberry is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Agriculture has deep roots in north central Minnesota. Those industrious, hardworking immigrants who built our nation came to Minnesota's rolling fields, clean waters, and grew food that fed a nation. These people first tended the land with animal power, oxen, horses, the sweat of their own toil. Then a miracle of their day's modern science and engineering was invented and developed. Steam power provided what seemed to be limitless potential, unbridled ability for work. Due to economic pressures, steam power from local sources of energy gave way to petroleum, gas, and diesel. But a dedicated group of enthusiasts continues to keep steam power alive and running. These hardworking people of Minnesota and elsewhere stoke the fires and turn the valves that carry on the metallic rhythm of steam power in Minnesota. This is the story of Blackberry and Dalton, Minnesota, each group dedicated to preserving a piece of our history. Well, I'm Glenn Melby, my father, George Melby, along with his brother, Ralph Melby, and nephew, Kenneth Bradfield, started this show at our home farm in the fall of 1954. And they had so many people Turned out without even any advertising, we had people coming and going all day long just to watch. And of course, the old timers that had grown up with steam engines, they were just in their glory. They would stand and listen to that steam engine puff. Uh, they had comments about every engine, their memories of times gone by for them. Uh, it's a good mixer for young and old. This is now our 60th annual show. And it has grown from four steam engines to, we've had as high as 30 steam traction engines on the grounds here. We have also gone from just a few hundred people to many thousands that attend the three-day show, which is always on a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday following Labor Day weekend. Now got approximately 30 buildings around here that are full of different antiques. Everything is from the old time woodworking shop, sawmill, threshing machines. Everything is from a period of time back before the 50s. Here at Dalton, Minnesota, we have built up a considerable size show. 
We own about 50 acres of land and the buildings that we have built up store all the displays the year round. We bring in a lot of other stuff. People bring in a lot of tractors and engines and old cars and things like that to show during this weekend. The majority of it stays here in sheds. So it's about a two week long process of getting it all out of the sheds, cleaned up, ready for people to come and see. And it's a, we think, a very good variety of things. We have uh, one building that's completely filled with things for homemakers, furnished like the old time home was, log cabins. You can see virtually anything from time way back for the last 75 years, maybe. As a family, we have always been interested in preserving the historic site of farming and also threshing. My dad, my uncle, who started this show, they were in the threshing business for many, many years with steam power and then the transition to gas power, of course, and eventually combines. But What we like about it, it's a family event. You can bring your small kids here and it's something they enjoy and they'll probably remember the rest of their life. And these two came all the way from Maine to be here. What do you think of Minnesota? We love Minnesota. Lakes and trees like and lakes friendly lakes. people. If it was their first experience at driving a small tractor or something around on the grounds here, and they learn things that you can't really learn just reading about them. That, uh, you have to experience it, and that's when you remember it. Of course, I grew up on a farm, and this brings back memories of virtually everything I had to do on the farm, except the livestock. I don't have any livestock here. I happen to have one steam engine here, which my father owned and threshed with and sawed lumber with for many, many years. My son and I, we have a lot of fun and interaction. Uh, with each other to uh, the style of it is called the Canadian rear mounted and it's a heavy engine half inch thick boiler plate on it, 25 horsepower single cylinder steam turns out about three horsepower for you have to take a 25 horsepower steam engine and uh, it'll turn out easily 80 horsepower on a dyno so it's uh, they're very underrated with the water in it and so forth it weighs approximately 16 ton if you would want it to have a closer look we can go and walk around we can show you a few things you can see it's a gar scott made by the m rumley company in richmond indiana this engine was made in about 1914. there's one other one here 
practically identical, but there's very, only about 30 serial numbers difference between the two engines. They call this a smoke box. You'll see that there's flues that go through the length of the boiler, and the water surrounds them, and it brings the heat through those flues. There's 56 of those flues, and my son and I replaced them in 1980, so we know how, <laughs> how much work it can be. Uh, but uh, it was well worth it. So we, uh, we try to, even if it isn't painted up real fancy, we try to keep it in good mechanical condition. You can see the pulley for driving threshing machines, sawmills, whatever, by the big drive belt. And the steering, you can see for the front wheel, that's heavy chains, everything is heavy. My son started building fire in here this morning before nine o'clock. We get ready to go on a parade around the grounds here at 1.30. It takes at least two hours to get up enough steam to move the engine and be able to get back here again without putting in a lot more wood. <laughs> the main thing is water. You gotta keep enough water on them because uh, water turns to steam and it, you get too little water that gets too hot too fast and then it can be dangerous. You have a steam valve up on top there you open to allow the steam into the cylinder and then you have a throttle there that opens the steam valve. The engine, the single cylinder, they actually exhaust twice on one revolution. They go past the port, allows the steam in, it goes past that, and allows the steam in that bay behind it, and then it goes so on both sides of the piston there's steam to push it the other way. And then you have a clutch to uh, engage the clutch to, so it'll move by itself on the wheels. You can see uh, what looks like a small barrel there. That's called the steam dome. And uh, you can see there's a whistle there, which of course is extremely loud. <laughs> but there's also two pop valves, so if you exceed the, on this one, we are limited or running at 100 pounds pressure, steam pressure right now, 100 pounds per square inch. And so if you exceed that, there will be one of those pop valves up there will let the steam escape. And if one fails, there's a second one for safety. What's it like operating a machine like this compared to a modern uh, gas-powered or diesel-powered? <laughs> well, there really isn't much comparison. <laughs> As you can see, it's much more complicated and labor-intensive. Uh, when you're pulling them or even driving around here, you generally like two men on them. One for firing and the other for you used to have to haul water, so you'd have an engineer and a waterman. And, uh, it's uh, more labor intensive. That was the problem back in the 30s. You couldn't afford to run them any longer on a small crop. You didn't need the power. It's much more complicated than a gas tractor. Uh, of course, there's nothing electronic on a steam engine, which can be very good because you don't have problems that you can't see, but you have to know how to handle them and you have to know something about the mechanics of them, how they work and why they work, and uh, be able to see a problem before it gets to be a real problem. This little box right there, that's filled with what you call steam cylinder oil and that works mechanically to allow uh, a little bit oil in with the steam, and that's what keeps it from running dry. Steam cylinder oil will mix with water. Where does one buy steam cylinder oil these days? Well, we've been very fortunate. We have, uh, uh, over the years, we have gotten from older uh, stations uh, that sold it at one time. Uh, I think altogether we've maybe been given four barrels of it over the years, and then we bought some. Now you have to buy a different it's a, a number on it now. It isn't necessarily called steam cylinder oil any longer. Up there, that mechanism with the three little balls on, that's the governor. That's what controls the speed of the flywheel or of the engine. 
as the speed increases, the springs on those weights go out and that will hold it at a set speed. I'm getting to the point where it's not so much fun to climb them anymore because you see to control a lot of this stuff you and then you, you go up here to turn your steam valves on and and uh, open and shut everything. And that's a whistle. <laughs> we have had a lot more but then we didn't have as much other stuff over the years and uh, when the old timers would die off. Some of the engines got sold and left the area, but uh, these have pretty much all been here for many, many years now. You hear that diesel engine running in the background. We have two of those big diesel engines. We Took them apart, hauled them in here from long distances. Beside the one you took pictures of, that big steam engine, which came out of Illinois, seven semi-loads to get it here. Uh, so it's uh, definitely a lot of cooperation to get the work done. I'm Norm Minert from Davis, Illinois, and the engine here is actually from Illinois. It was originally used, we think, about 1900 or 1905 time. It was used at a zinc foundry, and the idea of the big flywheel was it ran a rolling mill that rolled big blocks of zinc into flat material, and the flat material they sold then. Yeah, this engine runs on steam, and the reason for the place that it was located is they moved to where there was a coal underground. They harvest their own coal and produce their own heat for their boiler to run, generate the steam to run the engine. So it was very cheap to run because of the uh, coal available. Well, as vice president of a club in Freeport, Illinois, when we heard that four of these engines were being cut up for scrap. And I contacted a lady that owned them, arranged for a tour down there on a Saturday. Twelve of us guys went down and looked at the engines. And we got done, ready to leave. Uh, we knew she was getting $60 a ton. We knew we couldn't afford an engine. And she offered one, an engine for free if we could save one. Well, then you all seen 12 guys running around like, you know, how in the world do we move something like this? <laughs> so we wound up getting an engine, and then we called Milt Martinson up here, and he went down and made arrangements to get this engine, but they had to guarantee this operating within five years. And I come up here to the show, I think it was 1983, they had it all together except for the centrics that open and close the valves. And that part had all been cut off, scrapped out already. So my job was to time the opening and closing of the valves, and that's how I became operator of the engine. I can show you how some of these parts work on this engine, and it to help explain things to everybody. Here we go. Okay, these are uh, eccentrics that open and close the valves. Instead of a cam lobe like your car would have in it, these are just an offset circle that opens and closes. This is a throttle while we control starting and stopping the engine. And up there is a two ball governor that controls the speed of the engine if it was up to operating speed, which we're only running slow right now, so that's not affecting the speed right now. As it goes faster, the weight of the balls expand and they change the linkage 
to control the operation of the valves. But that controls the RPM of the engine. The flywheel by itself weighs 60 ton and it's 25 feet 4 inches in diameter and at a high speed that inertia of the flywheel being that heavy will carry a block of zinc through the mill without slowing down much. And that way you didn't have to have brute horsepower, you used a lot of the inertia of the flywheel to carry the, the block through the mill. On this engine, at the outer end of the crankshaft was directly coupled to a rolling mill that was about four foot wide, two four foot wide rollers. And there was a gear between the bearing and the flywheel. That gear ran power to the upper roller of the mill, so both rollers were under power when they fed the zinc through there. Now on these uh, centrics, when this opens up, you're pushing the piston forward in the cylinder, and when it get up, gets up the other end up here, then this set of centrics control the valve to push the piston to the rear. So you get two power strokes per revolution of the flywheel. We have a commercial boiler over here, which is oil fired, generating the steam, which comes over to this big receiver here, and then it gets to the valves here where we control how we use the steam. This clicking noise we hear is right now we're opening up the intake valve here to generate steam in there. When it reaches a certain point, it snaps and springs shut quick to save the rest of the steam for the next operation. Earlier engines had slide valves where, which weren't as efficient as these valves that snap off. Like This is very similar to a coreless valve action. To get in the valve works a little bit. The governor controls this rod coming down here and that determines how much steam is going into the cylinder by how much valve travel we get when it snaps and comes shut. It's used about its maximum stroke of steam that it needs. Now up to speed, that wouldn't travel very far because if it was up to speed and didn't need any more power, it'd just be a very short stroke and snap right back shut. And that's how they control the RPM of the engine. Now, right now we're running about six RPM and the original RPM would have been around 35 or 36 RPM. Now the flywheel in this engine is 25 feet, four inches in diameter. The flywheel itself weighs 60 ton, and with the crankshaft and uh, the rod and everything, the total weight moving right now is around 80, 85 ton of material. When it's turning at its full RPM, how fast is it going? Well, at 35 RPM, the outer rim of the flywheel is probably traveling about 40 mile an hour. Okay, now the steam is coming into this receiver. This receiver separates the steam. If there's any water condensers in it, we can bleed the water off here because we don't want water going in the engine. So the steam's coming in here, going into the cylinder or valve mechanism on the other side. And it's exhausting out, going up this pipe up through the roof. Now when you start a steam engine up, you need to bleed off any possibility of water. So there's two extra little pipes and valves there to bleed that off when you start up. Up here, that big rod is hooked to the piston inside the cylinder. That big mass there is moving back and forth. We call that a crosshead. That takes any up and down force that the connecting rod would have and it transmits it to the main housing of the base of the machine so that there's no force going to the piston as far as being up and down. The piston's always centered in the bore without wearing the bore out. And of course, the connecting rod goes back to the crankshaft to give you power to the flywheel. Now, if you want to go back into early history, the zinc was actually a byproduct of lead in southern Wisconsin and northern Illinois. And there was two young Germans right out of school come over here and decided 
to process the zinc and uh, it's basically a rust preventive for your roofing material and uh, what they thought this situation out further and decided if they went to down in Illinois a little further they found coal so that they harvest their own coal to produce their steam to run their equipment and it was cheaper to ship the ore down in a railroad car and rather than process the zinc where it was at uh, they went to where they had their coal for their power source to make it more feasible, more profitable to do the process. Well, just this morning we had school kids here from different classes. It explained to them that the fire was heating the water in the boiler to create the steam. The steam went over to push the piston back and forth and they took a lot of interest in that. But it's nice to see somebody learn from what we're doing. We encourage people to come and take in the show because it's uh, entertaining for the whole family. It's very good, clean entertainment. We try to provide nice grounds, everything neat and cleaned up. We pride ourselves in uh, taking care of our grounds all summer long. I think we have a very good show here of medium size. and uh, People can see in one day and it's very, very nicely laid out. Well, it's uh, just three miles off Interstate 94, about uh, 13 miles east of Fergus Falls, Minnesota. This is Dalton, Minnesota, where we are at. So it's uh, easy to get to, and yeah, we'd like to see a lot of people here.
From Dalton's Festival in central Minnesota, we move on to Black Bear, located near Grand Rapids in northern Minnesota. I'm Jim Rodenberg. I'm part of the North Central Minnesota Farm and Antiques Association. We're located in Blackberry Township, seven miles east of Grand Rapids, Minnesota, right on Highway 2. We're having our annual fundraiser. We're having our show, which lasts Saturday and Sunday, a two-day show. Today's Friday, our tune-up day. We invite area seniors over to look around and give us a little insight on what it was really like back then and hear some of their stories maybe we can add to our show. Oh, our organization, the North Central Minnesota Farm and Antique Association, what we do is try to reenact what farm life was like back in the mid-40s. That was a time when there was tractors becoming really prominent on the farm and still a lot of draft horses. So uh, we're trying to depict that way of life from the mid-40s. We have a lot of people here who enjoy restoring and maintaining old equipment. And most of us do that for a hobby because we enjoy doing it. It's no different than somebody restoring a car that you drove back when you were a teenager. A lot of us grew up on farms and we enjoy driving that old tractor like our grandpa had. So we do it as a hobby. In order to support that hobby, there's big toys that we can't afford to do individually. So together we can go out and buy an old antique steam engine and be able to restore that and operate it where you couldn't do that on your own solely. So the big group kind of came together to do stuff you can't do individually. Well, we try to keep this family oriented. We try to be a family type show where you can come in with your children and come bring grandpa along. and and Grandpa can tell you about some of the things that somebody else don't tell you about. So we try to make it a family thing. We try to attract people to come out for the whole day. We cook sweet corn with our steam engine. The ladies serve a super nice lunch. So we like people to come out and, and spend the whole day, get Sunday dinner and walk around, look at our displays and take a look back down the road where we came from. We have grain crops, we grow potatoes. Today, you look around, you'd see us picking up grain bundles, see thrash machine running in the field. Going back to the mid 40s when there were still a lot of horses on the farm, we have a lot of draft horse displays going on, giving rides. They'll be cutting grain with a horse-drawn binder. They'll be doing plowing. Well, we are constantly on the hunt for new members. We're always looking for new members. The only thing you really need to join is the interest in what we do. We charge $10 a year for a family membership. That's everyone in the family under 18 is included in that. We're trying to make this a family organization. We're always looking for new people solely because us old guys are starting to wear out. So we need some young blood to help with some of that uh, more uh, vigorous work.
So all you got to do to join is just contact us. We have a meeting the first Monday of every month at 7 o'clock in the evening right here in our hall. And uh, if you have an interest, please drop by and talk to us. We're always looking for people. Okay, if someone would like to make a donation to our organization, you could do so in several ways. You could come to a meeting, you could talk to one of our members. If you have some old piece of equipment in your backyard that would fit our display, we'd really love to come out and look at it and see if it's something we can use to make our show fuller, more complete. Yeah, you might have an item we don't have that could be repaired and make to made, restored, make to run again. So. Well, we're out here today threshing with steam and uh, like they did years ago. The, but the first step in that process, of course, was planting the crop and harvesting the crop. Hi, I'm Mark Lofgren and we're going to be threshing with steam in a little bit. But this crop that we're going to be threshing was planted last fall and this is rye. And it's grown all summer until it's ready, it's ripe. And we harvested it, we cut it and uh, with the binder and put it into bundles about a week ago. And those bundles are then stood up into what's called a shock. I want to take one of these bundles out of there. There's a little piece of twine that holds that bundle together, but that's a bundle of grain, bundle of rye, and then after they're stood into shocks, they're left to dry for about another week. And uh, then they're ready now, we can go over and, and do a little threshing. This threshing machine dates from about 1930, so I would make it about 80 years old, maybe a little more. The threshing machine such as this represents a major advancement in technology. Before threshing machines, mechanical ones like these came along, the threshing was done either by treading it out by humans or animals sometimes even walked on a grain to separate the grain from the straw. So this was a major step forward in mechanical harvesting. This machine happens to be a case 2236. The number 22 represents the width of the threshing cylinder and the 36 represents the width of the separating area. Threshing was done for a period of 40, 50 years, beginning in the late 1800s and into and up to, in some areas, as late as 1950. But more into the early 1900s, they were big time in the prairie country. And a machine of this size could have been owned by a larger farmer. There were many of these around. The bigger machines, of course, were owned probably by custom operators. A machine this size would have taken a crew probably of 10 or 12 people to keep this machine busy. one or two people to keep the steam engine fired and with water. And several bundle wagons, depending on the distance that they had to travel from the field in to the machine. A couple of what was called spike pitchers that would pitch the bundles into the machine. Sometimes they even bagged the grain as it came off the machine. We're going to put it into the wagon. That's what we do here into this grain cart. But it was quite a process. It took many people to uh, work as a team to get the job done. Well, many have gone on before us who are now gone that this was uh, livelihood dependent on this and they fed a nation with this type of process. This is how the product got on its way to the store and uh, this is part of what made our country, the great prairies west of here, these machines are all over. In fact, if you travel into the Dakotas, you still see them sitting alongside the road here and there. It's just a kind of remembrance of times gone by. For me personally, being involved in running the threshing machine, it's actually a learning experience for me. 
There are many things about this particular machine that I don't know. And uh, every year I learn something more. Uh, when I got involved with uh, North Central Minnesota Farm and Antique Association, if you would have asked me what a shock of grain was, I would not be able to tell you. So, so it's a learning experience, it's fun, working with other people, you could call it a hobby or whatever, but it's, uh, I just enjoy coming out here and doing this once a year, and, and it's a good time. Uh, Garrett Draws uh, here at the Blackberry Tractor Show. This here's a 1911 K steam engine used a lot uh, in the farming. Mostly with these threshing machines, uh, a lot of plowing fields. You can see the overpowering different equipment such as a sawmill, threshing machine, planer mills, anything like that. These are basically the predecessor to the gas engines. These are the ones that did all the work. So these are actually the ones that replace the horsepower. Yeah, it's uh, pretty simple, but big machines, heavy stuff, and a lot of temperature, and fun stuff. <laughs> Yeah, this uh, engine's actually made from two separate different tractors. Uh, the boiler was found up in a logging camp up in the mountains, um, and it was actually just a stationary boiler. Uh, then the guy who owns the tractor actually found a running gear for it as the wheels and all the bull gears and everything, um, and actually ended up mating the two together to make a running, moving tractor for it. <laughs> what I like is I like the mixture of technology. You got the cell phone going yeah, off in yeah. the pocket, and then the steam engine Here, in the back. take that. <laughs> yeah, that's what you always joke about. We got the pocket watch in one hand, and then the cell phone in the other. <laughs> You know, I've been doing this since I was really young. I've been on these engines since I was probably eight, nine years old. A lot of it's kind of second nature to me, but it's pretty cool seeing a lot of people walk up and ask where the key goes, or how do you start it? How do you jump the battery on it? Where the battery is? Where does the gas go? It's pretty cool to be able to actually run a piece of machinery this old and hardly anybody knows about them anymore and still try to get the word out about what it is and how it operates and what it was used for. Like I said, I've actually been at this show all of my life. It's been 22 years now. Actually, my mom was pregnant with me when she was down here. My dad's the other license operator on the other steam engine there. And, you know, we've ran these engines for years, just us two. And, you know, it, besides the point of being kind of a, a family deal for me, it's you have a great group of people around here. And it's a lot of fun. You learn a lot of new stuff from a lot of these old timers that they've got tons of knowledge that you don't hear about unless you ask. And like they say, once these people are gone, a lot of the knowledge is going to go with them. And if you don't get it from them right now, it'll go down to the grave with them. So. A lot of it's just taking into consideration the ingenuity and what they're able to do with what they had back then. If you were to take for today's standards, tell somebody to build that engine as it sits, that's a pretty big feat. Well, these guys are doing it 100 years ago without electronics, without electricity. Some of the tolerances and things that are held on these engines to make seals actually work and make sure the steam goes where you want it to. They basically made them on big, crude, manual machines, and it's just unbelievable how they even put these things together makes a guy really think about how the heck they did it and the ingenuity that it took to put into it just to even come up with the idea.
Yeah, now we'll uh, show you kind of how this uh, piece of machinery runs. Uh, rough idea. Uh, you can think of it almost like a modern day pressure cooker. Basically heat and uh, water to create steam. And uh, as you can see back here, we have our firebox. This tractor we run off of just wood. Uh, they, a lot of them also ran off of uh, coal. There was even straw burners. Basically anything that you could burn to create heat, they used it. You know, whatever they had the most of. If you look in that firebox there, all the way around the firebox, it's all water that's surrounding that. There's these tubes up front, they're called flues, and what they do, they actually take the heat and the gas and the smoke from the fire, run it all the way through the boiler, which gives you a more heat transfer for better pressure and a lot more heat to boil the water. All right, uh, real basic controls. Uh, you have your throttle here, which is basically your gas pedal on your car. Um, forward is all the way shut, which actually ends up turning the steam off to the cylinder, basically cutting your gas off to your automobile. Um, you pull it back, it puts steam to the cylinder, and pushes it. And then we got this lever right here, it's actually called the reversing lever. On this engine specifically, you actually forward is backwards and backwards is forward for your drive gear. Um, this actually moves this mechanism right up here which actually changes the valving in the valve box and basically makes the steam go different places to make the engine uh, rotate in uh, different directions. So and then uh, right here you've got your clutch lever. If you were to pull that back it'll tighten these big shoe, shoes up against that flywheel and actually in turn drives the bull gears and moves the tractor. But when you're powering a piece of equipment you leave the clutch disengaged so you can just spin the flywheel so you can act as a power plant for the piece of equipment. Actually, the uh, biggest thing that you got to watch is that big gauge right there. That actually reads the PSI or pounds per square inch of steam pressure you have inside the boiler. It's basically the only gauge you have to watch for other than your water level, which is actually located on the side of the boiler on this engine. And that'll tell you where the water level in the boiler is to make sure that you have your water on your crown sheet so things don't get a little bit too overheated. And then we've got uh, our two whistles up here. Different uh, tractors ran single whistles, more than two. Um, mainly used for signaling. Right now we've got two different tones. Little one, big one. And uh, mainly those are actually used for signaling uh, back when they would uh, be farming and using these uh, pieces of machinery for basically wood and water. Um, you had a certain set of tones where uh, if you pulled the whistle three short times, that meant that you needed water. Um, you pulled it, you know, say two times, that means you needed wood. If there's emergency, it'd be a, a series of real short blasts over and over. Um, that was basically the, the warning signs for, you know, what was going on to everybody else around the, the engine. All right, uh, this is actually the cylinder. You know, a lot of people say four cylinder, six cylinder, eight cylinders in their vehicles. This one actually only has one cylinder. It's got about an eight inch bore on it. One thing that's actually kind of special about these engines, usually in a regular internal combustion engine, you only have a power stroke from one side. You have the explosion on one side of the piston, which pushes it down and makes the power. This one actually, as the piston moves backwards and forwards, there's steam injected on both sides of the piston. So it actually has a power stroke on every stroke that it makes. And like we see here, behind there it's called the steam dome. That's actually where the, a lot of the steam is stored. Your water level, right about here, steam goes up into there, actually goes through a throttle mechanism, and then into something called the governor. What that does is actually regulates the engine RPM, and there's two weighted balls up there that go in and out as the, the engine slows or speeds up. And that'll actually automatically adjust the throttle for the load that's being put on the engine. After it goes through the governor, that's when it goes into the valve box. The valve box is what controls the steam for which side of the uh, piston it's going in and the exhaust steam that's actually coming out. And as everything moves, there's a rod back there that slides and actually opens up passageways and closes them off for depending on where the position of the piston is. Yeah, it's just amazing that it's 100 years old and still running. <laughs> yep. Yeah, hardly have to do anything to them. Get them tested in every couple of years and they're off to the races. <laughs>
Actually, different states have different uh, regulations and stuff. Some states don't require a certification at all, but in Minnesota, you actually have to log a certain amount of hands-on hours on a machine signed by a licensed operator, and then you actually have to take a Minnesota state standard test for a hobby boiler's license. You hear a lot about uh, Class A boiler, Class B boiler licenses. These aren't anywhere near that. Uh, it's a completely separate, different, uh, different test that they do. Um, but after that, it's like I said, it's basically a, you have a certain amount of hands-on. Um, you don't actually have to go to school for it. There are uh, different places around the state that uh, uh, set up almost like a college for uh, running these engines. Um, yeah, you just you take the test. Uh, you have your uh, so many hours of hands-on, and you apply with the state of Minnesota and get your card, and you're ready to go. <laughs> And now with these uh, steam engines, a lot of them had this uh, steering system. It's not like anything you would see today on a car. You have your steering wheel connected to your steering shaft and it actually connects to uh, gears that are down lower that actually run a worm screw that are hooked up to these chains. And as you turn the wheel, it'll turn that worm screw a certain direction. It will actually tighten and loosen each chain at uh, the same time turning the front end. They weren't very precise on their steering, but uh, it turned the front of the tractor and did it pretty well. <laughs> when this boiler came off the factory, a lot of these engines actually ran at 200, 250 PSI. These ones now, being that the engine's over 100 years old, we are only running at about 100 to 110 on most of the engines. We actually have a pop-off valve that, as soon as it hits the set pressure, will actually open and bleed off the pressure from the boiler. Like I said, with steam, the power is virtually unstoppable. You need something, you know, with more power, you just basically put more steam to it, higher pressure. They are using a lot with power generation. They actually have tried to make modern day cars run off of steam. It's very efficient, but it's not very convenient. That's the only problem with it. You know, I think, the, like the saying goes, you know, you can't forget your history and your past, otherwise some bad stuff can happen. And you know, if a lot of people don't understand a lot of where their food comes from and all that, well, this is the, the origin of where all that started from. Like I said, right after the horses, these were the machines that were out there plowing the fields and planting the crops that these people were surviving off of. Well, it's a way to remember the past. It's a historical piece of equipment. It represents technology before the computer age, where uh, they just had to engineer things out, trial and error, till they got it to work. It's good to demonstrate equipment like this nowadays. The younger generation coming along really doesn't realize where the rye comes from that's in the rye bread. Everybody has to eat, and uh, of course this country has always been noted for being very progressive and uh, raising a lot of food for export, uh, always had plenty of food and at reasonable price. Uh, that was the farm program in this country. And it worked out very well. Well, I think it's important for us to preserve history and it's important to them to know how all this industry came to exist and how it's all changed nowadays. But uh, I think everybody needs to know part of the history of our country. The reason we do this because everyone likes to have some idea where they came from or what life was like so we have some comparison between what our ancestors did and we do today. And there's been a tremendous amount of change in the last 50 years and we're trying to show the youngsters today what it was like to be young back in the 40s for example. And all this old equipment stuff that's around is slowly disappearing from the picture. It's not going to be around anymore so we're trying to preserve that so it'll be here for future generations. It's quite a challenge sometimes to get something totally restored to operate again, but it's, it's a real nice feeling when you get it all done to see it work. Well, I think our children need to have an idea of what their parents experienced, uh, what they went through, and to learn firsthand some of the hard work and really appreciate what their parents and before them their grandparents more so yet had to do just to uh, make a living and uh, get the food, produce the food that you had to have. Well, I think there could be a, a time when a lot of these skills could again be useful. Uh, so it's, it's things that worked in the past, we moved away from them, but sometimes they come back. History has a way of repeating itself. 
Sometimes when you're looking ahead where you're going, you have to take a look back, see where you came from. Steam Power was made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. To watch more stories like Steam Power, visit lptv.org and consider making a tax-deductible donation.